Tim Zacks. I'm a principal engineer at Red Hat. I work in DevOps. We do a lot of funky, cool stuff in Python. And today we're going to talk about practical usage of async I.O., uh, which is a new uh, technology that came out in 3.4. Uh, the syntax I'm going to use is 3.6. It's slightly different. So you may have noticed that Python is not the fastest programming language around there. In fact, some benchmarks that I've seen have even rated it as up to 20 times slower than C++. That doesn't make a big difference to most of us because you're supposed to use the appropriate programming language for the job. And most of what you're using Python for is not, uh, does not require lightning fast processing. What we use Python for very often is interconnected systems. So we, we might use our Python to connect to the web, connect to the database, other networking protocols. So what you're going to end up waiting for is the send and response time. So if you actually program this in C++, you would notice maybe a little bit of a performance difference in milliseconds, but the C++ code would also have to wait for that network uh, connectivity to get back to it. So there's a number of ways to solve this uh, issue of, of performance when you're dealing with other systems. So the two standard ways, traditionally, of dealing with um, this is to break your code down into small bits, uh, small reusable chunks, which can either be done as multi-threading, and as every Python programmer who's tried to use multi-threading knows, you get uh, hit with the, uh, the global interpreter lock, or the GIL. Or you can use multi-processing, which works a lot better but it can be more confusing uh, trying to figure out where your callbacks are, what exactly is happening, and doing your debugging. A third option, which has been available for a while, is to be using an event loop. And there's a number of different solutions that do this. You can either use uh, something like gevent or twisted, or starting in Python 3.4, you can use async IO. So what is an event loop? Most of us are familiar with the event loop as it relates to GUI systems. In a GUI system, you register your functionality, such as your button click or on mouse move, to the event loop. And then when you click the button or do your action, it goes over to the, it tells the, sends a message to the event loop to execute that code. So basically you're uh, defining everything you want the, event, the, the code to do, and then it gets executed in the future at some point in time. Now think about how this can work in a non-GUI system. So basically what we're going to do is define our event loop, register code pieces to it, that are not going to get executed until we actually tell them to get executed. So the event loop lets us have a lot of fun with coding because you can pause code in the middle, which is something that you can't do using traditional programming. You can schedule code for later. So you can say, this piece of code, I'm going to call it right now, but I don't want it to run for five minutes. You can cancel code in the middle and say, that function that I told you to run, I want you to stop it right now. And you can co uh, program asynchronous code. You can say, we want these five pieces of code to run at the same time as soon as uh, it has the ability to run those. So using a single process, you're going to say, run this, 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 and this. If, that, if, if one of those pieces has to wait for something, such as getting something from the network, talking to a database, or any other uh, function that it has to wait for, 
then it's going to just uh, say, I'm going to pause myself, go get another piece of code, and do that. So it switches when it's waiting for different code. Right? You have a special keyword here, which is await, which says, if I have to wait right now, then go and switch to anybody else who's waiting for the processor and uh, come back to me later. So it shares just like a CPU does, which is that keeps on processing and that uh, makes it the most efficient that it can be. So in order to do that, and now we're going to get to the coding part of this, and I wasn't brave enough to do live coding. Uh, so we have what's called a coroutine. And as you can see, there's a uh, new keyword in front of the uh, def statement called async. And async defines this as a coroutine. And in, in uh, 3.4, you would use a decorator, uh, which you would say in front of it that this is a coroutine, async io coroutine. Um, and here we're going to define a useless demo function, which isn't going to do anything. Uh, and as you can see, we're going to print out uh, a message when we start the function. Then we're going to go to sleep for a second, and then print out a message when it's done. After that, and that's basically the coroutine. A coroutine has to be called from another coroutine. You can't just call a coroutine, because uh, that would be too easy. So the first thing we do in our actual code is we get our event loop. And there's multiple event loops that are possible. In most uh, implementations of uh, async I.O., you're going to pass that loop into all of your functions to make sure that you're using the same loop. Um, I didn't do that in this example because I was just uh, uh, playing around. Uh, and then we're going to create our actions. Our actions, that is a list of activities that we want to accomplish right now. And here we're going to basically pass in to our useless function uh, five actions, which are uh, the letters A, B, C, D, and E. And we wrap that around the loop.createTask. Loop.createTask is the function that creates a future. A future is a uh, coroutine that will execute sometime in the future. Um, and then we call actions, which means take all of these um, functions that we're going to run. It's going to run five functions, and it's going to say run all of these at the same time. This is a single set of blocking code, which means that until all five of those uh, are finished, then it's not going to continue onward. And we run run until complete, which means it's actually going to wait until it finishes all of those. There's other ways of calling this. You can call later. You can call soon, uh, depending on what you want to do. But this basically says we want these five to run asynchronously, run at the same time, but don't complete until we're finished with all of those. And so let's see what happens if we actually run that. So we see that it starts all five of them before it continues. So it runs A, then B, C, D, E, and then as we can see, it finishes them also, A first, B, C, D, and E. And that's because we slept for one second for each one of them. So as soon as it goes to sleep, it then registers itself waiting for the next call, so you can then uh, expect it to be finished first. We don't have to have them to finish at the same order that we gave them to, though. So if we uh, define in our actions a value for the sleep, so here we have D is finishing in point 0.1, is only sleeping for point 0.1 seconds, and B is sleeping for point 0.2, then we can assume that D will finish first, B will finish second, and then A, C, and E. And that's exactly what happened. Well, ah, then we've got our, our function here where we pass that into sleep. And uh, when we call it, then we can see that's exactly what happens, is that we, they all start in the correct order. Uh, D finishes first, B finishes second, and we keep on going. Now, you may have noticed that I was using a function called asyncio.sleep, which is different than the typical operating system call time.sleep. Time.sleep uses your operating system sleep. Uh, Async.io doesn't. It has its own version of sleep, which we're going to go into soon. 
And what happens if we try to use the this, this standard version? Why do we have to use our own version? First of all, one of the advantages of asyncio.sleep is that you can pass in fractions of seconds, and in time.sleep you can't. But here we get a error, and we're going to go into exactly what, how, how this uh, error is formatted later, but it says object none type can't be used in await expression, and that's an error that you get whenever you try to do an await call on blocking code. Blocking code means that the code is supposed to wait until it's finished and not give back processor. So async.io is based on only working with code that is supposed to give back to the processor. Sharing is caring, and so if the uh, process says, uh, I'm going to be using futures, I'm going to be using coroutines, it can then return back to the processor and, or back to the, uh, to the event loop, and it can start processing other pieces of code, but it can't do it with this. Another interesting thing here is with that error, uh, because we didn't get the error, and I'm going to talk about that also in a minute, is that if you exit, you're going to get an error message that says the task exception was never retrieved, and then it's going to give you what the exception is. Because it's expecting that you're going to deal with all of these ex exceptions that you get. So how does sleep work? And sleep uses async IO also in order to process it. And if we look over here in the middle, it gets the event loop, and then it does a call later with a delay. So call later is one of those functions of async.io, which says, I want to run this code on the, um, on the event loop at a later point in time. And you pass in the delay, um, and then it comes back and uh, uh, returns. So here when we call our sleep, and you can see that sleep has other functionalities, such as it, you, you can pass in the delay, you can pass in a result, which is what it will return when it's finished sleeping, and you can pass in the loop that you're using if you want to, and if you don't, then it just gets another loop. So how do we do non-blocking code? Uh, there's, you might want to use uh, the system in order to do web scraping. It's a standard functionality. You're going to think, you know, this is great. I'm going to now go and get my 10 websites, grab them, and then while it's waiting to download them, it can already start processing the ones that it got. But requests is not a, is a blocking uh, piece of code. You can't use requests with async.io natively. So somebody wrote a module called AIO HTTP, which returns um, uh, right away. It's non-blocking. So the way that that works is if we look at the async.io create connection function is that it uses the standard socket library which has a set blocking function and you set set blocking false. And then obviously you have to deal with all of the details of what that means if it's false. Uh, this is not a new feature in sockets. You could have done this already in, uh, in the Python 2. And then we see that at the end it does a yield from. Yield from is the same thing as await. The way that coroutines work, I forgot to mention, is that they are basically generators. So what you do is you define your generator, you call the function, it doesn't actually do anything until you say yield or await. Await and yield are, are the same thing in uh, coroutines. So now that we know how to use our AI HTTP, AIO HTTP, uh, we can now go ahead and build our web scraper. So we're going to look for the word the uh, in the following uh, Python blogs, because that's an important statistic to know, is how many times Python blogs write the word the. And it's important to note this is not a production script. Uh, it will not find the word the with capital letters if the word the is included in another word like together. It's also going to find that, so if your boss asks you to write a script like this, uh, make sure to modify it as is appropriate. So the first thing we're going to do is define our coroutine, right? And so we're going to define our coroutine. We're first of all going to say that we only want it to be with a specific timeout. And then we're going to, we're passing in a session, and we'll look at what that session is in just a moment. Uh, we use AIOHTTP to get the URL. 
And at that point, we say um, uh, we, we're going to wait for it. It's, it's uh, async with is now going to wait for the response. And then we have a content equals await response.txt, which is an awaiting call in order to get the response. So at this point, it's sending out the message, saying this is what we want. And then it's going to wait until it comes back so it can free up the, uh, the event loop to do other code. And then finally, on the bottom, we're going to do a content.count to, uh, uh, to see how many times that word exists. The function that calls this is also a coroutine because we have coroutines that call coroutines. And here we're going to create the task called getData, which is the function we saw before, uh, for all of the URLs. And that's also an awaiting message. So it's going to uh, call each one one at a time and wait for it to finish. And then we have the basic script, which is where we get our loop. Uh, we use create a client session. Uh, pass in all of those pages that we told it before. And then we go and we process the results. And it's going to sit here on the loop dot run until complete until all five of those pages are completed. They may complete with errors. Uh, if you cancel in the middle, then that's going to give you back a pending. Um, so that returns two different sets. There's a set of completed and a set of pending. We're only looking at the completed results. And then we look at data dot result which is where all of your results are coming from. And so if you remember over here, what we returned was the URL and the count of how many times the word the is mentioned. So over here we see how the um, asynchronous code works is that it goes one at a time and gets those, um, those URLs. We can see that uh, it got the planet Python response, even though that wasn't the first one that it started with, and then it goes onwards until it gets all of them. And then finally, it gives you back your results using that for loop, which is not in the same order that you asked it for. So you can't assume that just because you sent uh, a list of of tasks that the results that you get back are in that same order, and that's why you always have to return back some uh, indication of what um, uh, of what task it is. Now we also have error handling, and what I did over here in the pages is, if you look at the third one, I added uh, I, mu I mangled the uh, the uh, URL so that it's going to die. And then I added over here a try and accept inside the get data, uh, which basically says that if it's uh, any sort of exception, then just write an error and what the error is. And then here, if we look at the results, then we get our normal results for the first four. And the fifth one comes back with a normal uh, error that tells or the, the uh, same thing, which tells us what the error is so that you can deal with it. Now, sometimes you don't know what the error is going to be, or you're not expecting an error, because as developers, we assume that all of our code is going to work 100% of the time. Um, so over here, what we're going to do is use our try except outside of the loop. And we're going to say, any errors that happen to happen, I want to know about it right here. And what happens is, as you're going through your result loop, is that when you hit the result that is an error or an exception, it's going to come back and give you that exception. So the exception bubbles up, but into that result object. So, the res so you don't get an exception as you're running it. You get an exception when you hit that, uh, that point. And so over here we have, it shows us our results. And then when you have the error, it shows it that as the error, because that's what we asked it to do. So now, does anybody remember my talk from last year? So last year we talked about meta classes and, and how they work in order to, uh, how we could build a logging system to show usage and error data. And that worked great. Um, we defined this meta class. It goes and attaches itself to the entire system and um, goes and sends logs. And that worked great for a while, but people started to complain because we were sending all of our logs to Logstash, and they said, there's performance issues because while you're sending logs to Logstash, uh, we have to wait. And so I started looking at this, 
And the way that this works is we have a wrapper function, right, which goes around and tells you how the code is going to work. And instead of calling the code directly, we decided to call generate log and do all of our logging uh, asynchronously. Now, the problem is, is that the standard Python logger is blocking code. And so therefore, it won't work in async I.O. But async I.O. has a solution for this. And the solution is to run it in either threads or multiprocessing, but make it look like async I.O. code. And that way, you can get into the habit of writing an async I.O. code, uh, even if it doesn't necessarily work that way. And so they have this function called run an executor. Run an executor says, take this code, run it in a different thread, but give me back a future so that I can pretend that it is running in async I.O. And so what I've done over here is we call the generate log function. And then I say call soon. And what call soon does is it says, don't run this right now. Call this in a second, or as soon as it has the ability to call it. And what that gives me is the ability to also call do func, which is what the normal function that you called is, that the meta class grabbed. And so then it does both of them at the same time, but it's not going to, uh, to wait until the, call, until the uh, logging function is done. And that's all we've got. So Red Hat's a great place to work at. Uh, one, one of the things you get is this awesome fedora. We've got a uh, pretend fedora as a gift for somebody. <laughs> and if you want the real fedora, come to work for us. You get to play with a lot of cool Python stuff and get to play with the uh, latest in technologies. Any questions? Yeah. The advantages of async I/O over multi-threading is the clarity of the code. Uh, first of all, and second of all, that you're only dealing with a single process instead of multiple processes. So if you're having a problem with your code, you don't have to start looking at all of the processes on the system to try to figure out which one is causing your problems. You have everything under a single process. Well, thank you very much for listening.